Off we go. We're back. We got another Q and A episode this week, guys. Um, we're gonna get into that here shortly. What do we want to get into? We, oh, we wanted to cover that uh, uh, Weinstein, the Weinstein, Weinstein podcast. Weinstein is it? Is it Weinstein? I always yeah. call it Brett Weinstein. I know, but because of Weinstein. Epstein. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, but uh, since we're gonna do a Q and A before we go into the Weinstein, because I I thought that was very interesting what you talked about, because um, it kind of relates to the thing. A lot of people. The well, question, let me yeah. let me tell people what yeah. that podcast was. I guess first, right? That was a. I had heard his brother mention his brother uh, Eric Weinstein mentioned Weinstein. on the most. The, the I'm just same, gonna yeah. whatever. I'm, I'm winging it because you, you we, reading we'll, too we'll much, say one and I'll say the other because you say Epstein all the time. You're looking at Epstein all the time. <laughs> what, is so he, what does he pronounce it as? Did he pronounce it as Epstein? That? Yeah. No, no, no. no Weinstein. Epstein, uh, Stein. Weinstein. Yeah, okay. Epstein. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. So I, then I'll do him the best. He's best. gonna do I'll go Weinstein. I'll call it Weinstein, but. Uh, Eric, the brother, was on a recent episode of the Joe Rogan Experience. Um, very, very, very good. Very well spoken. I'll, I'll Eric right is on. a mathematician and yep. economist. Yep. And then his brother, Brett, he, he, he talked on Rogan's podcast about a po- conversation he had with his brother, Brett, on his own podcast, which is called The Portal. So it's The yep. Portal with Eric Weinstein. There you go. Weinstein. Stein. Fuck. Yeah. See, I admit. It's okay. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever. I'll but, say Weinstein. But but that's you, the you one. do you and I'll do me. Yes. I'm on that. But that is the podcast that they um, that we're kind of going to talk about. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we wanted to mention it. The so Eric uh, Weinstein is a uh, evolutionary uh, biologist. That's Brett. Brett. Sorry, Brett. Brett. Eric is the mathematician, economist, and Brett is the evolutionary biologist. Yeah. Before we get in there, because today is going to be a Q and A. And I've noticed from the types of questions that are being asked is that um, the satisfactory answer that you're looking for does not exist. Mm-hmm. I think it's something we need to explain. Like you used to have those answers that are basically yes or no or very binary or even uh, very... There's good and there's bad. There's monolithic. Right and there's wrong. Yeah. You know, very monolithic answer. That was school. Um, but the fact is, most of this life is made of complex uh, systems where there is no satisfactory answer, yeah. at least at where we are with mankind right now. Like when I talk about neuroscience, a lot of the stuff, it's basically the last 10 years. The, I think this, this, so first of all, the main issue I think on this is cool, mm-hmm. that has trained all of us to think there is an answer and a simple one at that yeah. when there isn't. When did uh, World War II start? Right. The fact that we can give a day to say when World <laughs> yes. War II started yeah. tells you exactly what was wrong with school. Yeah. But so if you ask someone, when did World War II uh, start? They'll tell you, what do you like August 39? I can't remember the months. I think uh, it was August. I'm pretty sure it was only, only started when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Yeah, right. Okay, so there <laughs> you go. Exactly. The world was all at peace, then that happened, right. and then we had enough. Right, exactly. That's how so, this is, yeah, well, but that's how, in a way, if you look, that's how we were all raised with satisfactory answer mm-hmm. because you want to know when it started. I want the day. Yeah. It's like, so, but by the way, was that at midnight? Or 1201. Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? The gremlins. Nah. Right. But if you're on the plane, <laughs> you, you, you know I mean, like, but by the way, it's always 12 somewhere. So is it nighttime or is it midnight? Because uh, what, what happens when it's uh, daytime savings? Do the gremlins know that? Do they know. Do they right. operate on daylight savings? Right. Exactly. So you see what I mean? This is exactly the problem is you get the uh, don't feed a, uh, a gremlin past midnight, but then you run into issues because. <laughs> Define midnight. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> this is a little bit the problem we have with the q and is where you want a satisfac- satisfactory answer that does not exist. Yeah. And on top of it, uh, we are and a lot of time we are going into very specific uh, stuff, like for example, neuroscience or whatever, where you have to understand like um, what I'm talking about is at the forefront of it. And some of the questions, we don't have the answers yet. Like mm-hmm. science does not have the answers yet. Yeah. This is also something I think we all, because of the internet and everything, we all think there is an answer to your question out there. Like that, that all knowledge is out there. That it's and in, it isn't. That somebody, it's in somebody's brain or it's in mm-hmm. some book and it is fully formed. And you yeah. ask the question. And anyone, the thing is usually someone who's going to come down, it is this, this, and this because of this, this, and this right. and cannot be this. That person is probably not giving you the complete picture either 
No, they don't, they're not, they're because there is, no, yeah. there is no such thing. Uh, so, but again, going back to school, you think, th- you think, you, you know, as a group, we think that out there, there is an answer to the question. Not always. Yeah. Because we haven't, we, no one came up with it yet. And so the stuff I talk about is actually very much in the forefront of certain things. And so uh, people, you know, want like, well, but what about this happens? They're like, well, we don't know. Well, and then that official that official answer so much is based upon a scientific what's the word like validation structure that's now how old is this peer review structure in the states has been right 80 yeah. years yeah. 70 or 80 years or so I, right now by the way we can talk about this too because everybody's always talking about peer review this is less than 100 years old yeah like that the, that idea that the greeks said that peer review was the only way to do science is yeah. actually wrong now in this in this that's not what peer review meant in this weinstein's yeah podcast yeah. though he had he mentioned about, yeah. there, there's two sides of this that are really interesting the first is the the theory and i won't get into the specifics because he explains it much better than i but basically because of the breeding that has gone on amongst lab rats over well, the course of that. the last mice. can you yeah okay of, of lab mice that basically all of the mice that have been used well, I forever can, i can explain have simply. been have been have been like compromised in a way that makes them able to or more well suited to fight off illness at a young age um okay, and you can so go into I, the specifics yeah yeah that. i can explain so the, the podcast what it was about um when brett was a undergraduate right he uh he was very, a very talented already um evolutionary biologist and then he was uh having a, an issue for example like uh, small animals have short lifespan mm-hmm. unless they are capable of fighting off predators through flying or venom. Mm-hmm. So for example, a bat can live 40 years, 50 years, which is very, very long for such a small, um, small creature, small, small creature. Yeah. But so a mice has a very, very uh, short time span and stuff like that. But he was starting to, so looking at the DNA and things like that, he saw something that was very strange in the lab mice. So. What happened with the live mice is, so we have to understand that a cell can only uh, replicate so mm-hmm. many times, yeah. right? So um, the, the number doesn't matter because it varies, but basically there's always a moment where the, the cell will stop replicating. Mm-hmm. And when it, so when it happens, the cell dies. So that's aging, yeah. senescence, what yeah. they call senescence, yeah. aging, right? That's the aging process. Um, if you did not have that limit, the cell would keep uh, replicating uh, again and again and again, and that's there is one uh, type of cell that does that. It's the cancer cell. Yeah, they call it death by immortality. Right, that's what he called it. Yeah. Right. So, where, where, um, where a cell, uh, that that cell trying to divide in order to live forever, just to right. that 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 immortality pull of that cell is essentially going to kill you, yes. the organism. But so people know, there's actually an immortal cell out there. It's mm-hmm. called Hela. Yeah. Did I talk about this in the last podcast? Not on the podcast. We talked about it. I did, uh, a line called Hela, H-E-L-A, because of a name, uh, a lady com, called Ellen something. And she had a cervical cancer. And those cells were, uh, were seen to be immortal in the sense of as long as they get fed, they keep replicating. Yeah. And so what's very interesting is that um, that line of cells from that lady, from the... 1800s. It was a long something. time ago. It was. It was during. I don't remember which vaccine. One of the. It, it was polio. Maybe? No, no. She died of cancer. Yeah. And shortly after cancer. that, then they had used that to start developing the vaccines. It might have been polio. Yeah, I think she I was right because the reason for that is because like all they had to do was take the cells, and then they would replicate an infinitum. So that lady, her cancer cell has have been the number one provider of cells of human cells for study. Is Helen, that crazy? Helen Lacks. Helen Lacks. Yeah. That was on her. I'm that sorry, Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks. Oh, Henrietta. Okay. Henrietta Lacks. Um, I wish I, this, of course, I'm not going to oh, find it, was but yeah. the biomass that had been produced by this, right. of this thing is insane. It is like, uh, like, like thousands and thousands of tons yeah. of these cells have been produced since then. But all from one line. Yeah. So... All the study we're doing on human cells comes from one line, because one person. The, the, and normally the issue that they have is scientists will end up, when they're studying these types of cells for this, not, not, not the mm-hmm. HeLa cells, yeah. but in trying to use 
other living tissue, you spend as much time trying to keep the tissue alive as you do actually studying right. it and doing right. it. Whereas in this case here, these things just go. Just keep going. Yeah. So that makes it much easier. So the, um, there's a non-coding part of the DNA that is the countdown mm -hmm. as to how many uh, times the cell can divide. Yeah. That non-coding DNA, DNA is called a telomeres. Yeah. So telomeres is the number of times the cell can duplicate. And if it is, and they start long, it they depends. start with a longer, well, not, no, not, yeah. not so the, whatever every, length so they we start, start at, they shorten over time. Right. So every yeah. time you duplicate, you take one off. Yeah. Every time you duplicate, uh, replicate the cell, you take one off, yeah. one off, one off. So it's a, it's a countdown. Yep. So maybe not knowing. You know, the punch count. Exactly. It's a punch count. Yeah. So when right. you're it's out, when you're all out, cell. you're all out. Then you die. So yeah. it's a punch count of the cell, right? So again, so that uh, cell don't become cancerous. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, a, so that a single cell's wish for immortality doesn't kill you. Right. Yeah. And so there's a whole thing with, remember Paul Davis and cancer? Mm -hmm. It seems that there's an entire thing where cancer cells are being activated. Anyway, yeah. so there, there's an entire thing where immortality is a very important stuff. The, what is important to know for this conversation is that the healing process is a matter of replication. Mm -hmm. Right, you need to replicate the cell. You got cut. They get together. They have to replicate. There's, there's an entire thing there. So that means that the longer the telomeres, the more you can replicate the cell. Yeah. Right, the more you can heal. The also the more you're likely to go to develop cancer toward that cell. So if you have very long set of telomeres to start, an organism does. That means you're Wolverine with cancer. Yeah. So you're Deadpool. Yeah. Right, so Deadpool, Deadpool will ha would have extremely long telomeres on all his cells, yeah. which means he heals co uh, almost continuously, but he has cancer at the same time. So and the cancer and the healing process are actually very close. And that he the, now the thing is that healing process, when applied to uh, doing scientific studies, what happens? They believe that these mice have very long telomeres. Right. So let's, of let's go into bred. that first. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. So let's go into that one. So what happened was. Uh, he was studying the mice and saw that the lab mice had very, very long telomeres. And he, and he could not understand why, because in nature, it doesn't work like that. Like the, the aging process of small animals is fast, so therefore mm -hmm. they should have short telomeres. Goes on and on and on like that. So he's like, but the lab mice that he's seeing have very long telomeres. So it doesn't fit evolutionary biology principles as he sees them. So instead of trying to change the principles, he starts to look at the mice. And he discovered that those mice are all being produced in one, for the US, one lab in Maine, I think, or wherever yeah. the fuck it was. One lab, only one. And so what happened? And then he discovered that and he's like, ooh, but that's, that could be a problem. So do wild mice have short telomeres or long? Short. Right. And so, could, and so yeah. when they tested, what they saw was that the mice had short telomeres. So that changes everything. So long story short, um, what they did at the lab is they, in order to get um, more mice, to produce more mice, they were giving um, the mice like eight months to reproduce. Yeah, and they, then were they were reproducing taking, at a very young age. Because they reproduce faster at a yeah, young age. Yeah. Mice, and then they go, they go slower as they get older. Yeah. So the second the mice got to eight months, they were taking out of the batch. Yeah. So that they could keep young mice reproducing so, to produce more mice. Yeah, which is a, a human... Uh, what's the word? A, a, a human manipulated, right. basically unnatural selection. So exactly. So they created an environment where there was no um, no predators, early breeding. Exactly, early breeding. So what they had basically, so early breeding means, in that sense, long story short, means longer telomeres yeah. because they grow fast, faster, but then they would die earlier normally. So in nature, they would die early, mm -hmm. but in that case, it didn't, it didn't matter since at eight months they were all removed. So they removed. The, a way that nature has to make sure that those ones, for example, those lab mice all die of cancer. If you let them uh, live, they all die of cancer. All of them, they said, yeah. The lab mice. Yeah. Why? Because we have removed uh, nature's way of removing those mice out of the way by providing no predators and making sure we only breed the ones that breed the earliest. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we basically were scanning without knowing for long telomeres mice. Yeah. And so now they start to look 40 years later, 50 years later, whatever, at the mice, and they have all uh, long telomeres. Right. So why is that a problem? <laughs> because as I say, long telomeres allow you to heal faster. Yeah. Right. So that's good for the mice. But if you're going to use the mice in order to test drugs. Especially, especially the, when you're hoping for things beyond the short term. 
Because right now, yeah. the way they study the toxicity of chemicals right, with, exactly. with mice is because they have a short lifespan, we don't want to wait 10, 20 years to subject animals. And, and we can't do it with humans we anyway. We'd be 80 yeah. years before we can right. take them. So that's why we're using mice. Yeah. Because we can't do it on larger animals yeah. because larger animals take too long. Yeah. So and on so mice. When, yeah. And when testing for that toxicity, my understanding is what they do basically now is they just kind of give it a lot over its short lifespan exactly. and then and they see just kind of see what happens right. so right so they shorten the stuff right yeah. so that's the, because that's the easiest way to yeah. do it but that's if the they're extremely resilient right so what fast. you're getting is you're giving toxins to deadpool yeah it doesn't give a shit he yeah. heals right through it so imagine if we based like in the us the fda requirement to know if a drug is valid or not is to give it to deadpool or wolverine yeah You'd be like, well, that's a fucked yeah, up. He was okay. <laughs> yeah, he was okay. So we don't know. So that and that's been the problem. And so he uncovered that that all the testing for drugs that were done were done on mice that heal way, way exponentially <coughs> better than humans. Yeah. So therefore, the drug testing was wrong, and he went even further, like test doing on mice that have to do with what they call metabolic insults, mm -hmm. uh, where biased yeah was not good you've got you've got essentially super healing mice exactly yeah and, and so and also though not just super healing but they're also very 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 biased towards and b like because of that we have no idea of what the toxicity can be when human beings yeah, are exactly. taking these things beyond the short term because when things do go to human trials uh they're not testing you for 15 years of exposure to this fucking Blood right. pressure medication. No, plus, even if you, that means that when you take one pill, you might have get major side effects yeah. that, that didn't show because that mice could heal mm -hmm. we are faster than you can. That means that not even long term, even short term, we wouldn't know yeah. because it didn't kill the mice. Yeah, but it might kill you. So Vioxx was a good stuff. I remember the painkiller because mm -hmm. I know I remember I took it when I had this. Yeah. Uh, I stopped after two because my head was going to explode. Yeah. And then they saw there were heart problem, there were uh, brain aneurysm and stuff like that. All uh, anyway, all um, cells that don't replicate well, yeah. uh, long. Uh, so they, 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 an, that, that means that even in the short term, the drugs that were tested were not necessarily safe for human consumption because those mice were way, who heal faster, way, uh, way more. And on top of it, what they also meant is that all those mice are very, very susceptible to get cancer. Much, much more than humans. So yes. that means that if you were to, to uh, test something that could give cancer on those mice, the answer would be yes. yes, because that mice, by definition, is going to get cancer out of anything. So we're testing these creatures. Well, that's the other thing. We're testing our medication on creatures who will almost 100% guaranteed die of cancer. Yep. They, they all die of cancer. So no matter what you give them, they're going to die of cancer. So if we are going to take, the, hopefully, that that mouse-to-human transfer model is close, at best, we may be okay by taking these medications, then we're all going to die of cancer. Right, <laughs> right. So we, uh, we, no one, none of us are. We're not going to die of cancer, but we all going to die of by the toxicity. second pill of yeah. toxicity. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, now that is what's funny is that is incredible. It is it's and, mind blowing. And, and, and now he has said this. He has said this. He brought it forward. We'll, we'll get into what happened after that. And he has also said, who knows? He said once they found this out, they could have gone through and changed the breeding protocols. That could have we been, but the know. issue is, all of that was kept in house. Oh, he got buried. He got buried. Uh, Way more than kept in house. Someone, he went to journalists, he got buried. He, he went to a, universities, he got buried. Someone who helped him with the project uh, basically panned it on the, on the peer review. He had to go back and fight again to get it published. Finally, it got published. Then that person who panned him wins a fucking Nobel Prize. Nice, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and uses his work, his hypothesis, his everything. During her speech. During her speech, brings it up on the thing. And then again, he has to go back and prove because the conversations they had were telephone calls. Yeah. There was no paper trail. And, uh, and, and it's a real shame. Now, that episode... And by the way, when she talked about it in her speech, uh, in the Nobel Prize speech, she um, put it in a light saying, oh, look, it was good that they did that. It allowed us to see this or this. She never explained the what fundamental what it, the fundamental issue that they had. Because that means a lot of studies are non-valid, yeah. cannot be replicated in the real world. And um, 
and that the entire drug testing system in the US was flawed. Yeah. No, no one wanted to say that. All they did was like, oh, yeah, yeah, and they just buried it. And so she basically lied her way forward, even during her Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize speech, which yeah. is insane. Yeah. And so to get into all of the back behind that, I'd recommend you listen to that podcast. It's fascinating. That's episode 19 of The Portal with Eric Weinstein. Um, there you go. All right. Uh, we then, posted it on the traffic yeah, community. And then, yeah. and, and um, also Brett has a uh, has his own podcast called the Dark Horse Podcast. Mm -hmm. That if you do want to sift through and talk about sift through the bullshit and the news and talk about just and hear people talk about the science yeah. of even this uh, coronavirus outbreak yep. and some of the things, it is incredible hearing a very smart evolutionary biologist talk about these things and and goes into and and kind of dismantles some of the mis preconceived notions that are getting like thrown. Five G. Well, he's just sticks with what people know right or what he knows yeah um and doesn't doesn't bear to speculate too much but i will say finding his podcast was a great thing for me to find yeah. after hearing this yeah. and so i do recommend both those guys have seem seem very well spoken brilliant men don't seem to have a bunch of crooked motives behind them so i highly no, recommend no you can tell too. because they they're willing to have uh conversations yeah. with people agreeing disagreeing what they want is to move the ball forward yeah. but that also showed you how again the problem in the academic world and the medical world the fact that this shit went through like with no one knowing about it yeah. to me that that was over 20 years ago now yeah. and it never came out like uh, the fact that you didn't write a book and cash in on that tells you how much of a only science guy he is. Yeah. And so, so you guys know, Brett, Brett Weinstein, how did he become famous? Because of the Evergreen College thing. Yeah. He's the one, by the way, he's Jewish, and he's the one who complained about the non-white on a uh, college campus that they had Evergreen. Yeah, yeah. And they, they basically uh, blasted him and tried to say he was racist and oh, all they these did things. Say that, well, yeah, and they, they were say. bordering yeah. on attacking him. They took over the university. I think he was like yeah. hiding under his, in his car. But well, they were looking uh, like, for him with baseball bats. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's crazy. So it's a weird thing that that's kind of how he became yeah. famous um, when really yeah. his contribution has been something totally else. The other funny thing is about this, they were accusing him of being racist and he had literally been... Uh, fired by the administration as last university for defending women of color against has harassment from that administration, and um, then it, it was came oh, back. It was even more than that. It was it was uh, and in then college come back and or got something the like that, kicked and he defended black women from being sexually harassed by a frat by some frat boys. Yeah, yeah. and he complained about that. And yeah, and got demolished at the oh, time. Oh, that's right. That. And then right. they went after the administration. Yeah. That was yeah, the, yeah. So, yeah. It was so, from a frat so boy. He was thing. one yeah. of those things where he, where he said, "No, no, no, you." He's like. You don't get to just throw that around and people get scared but of does, saying that. But he, he never says it. His brother said it. Yeah. Like, he never defended himself. That that's guy. that's another warning, by the way. When you watch that podcast of uh, The Portal, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be totally honest with you. You need minutes. to listen to it because it's a really good... You're going to understand the guy. But the but first is, 30 minutes. It's almost 40 minutes before they get into the the meat of this where his brother but just his brother's like blast. dude quit talking about this we need to talk about the greatest contribution you've made yeah. to science and how they buried and, you and by the way uh, Eric is very mean about it and very yeah. uh, he, he makes it at some point you're like dude stop the two very smart brothers who grew up together who probably <laughs> had a lot of really snide little arguments yeah. so, <laughs> exactly and you so, can and he, and he does show up but once he starts talking about the stuff it's mind blowing and again he shows you the state of academia today and the state of medical world it is run by money i don't think there's a i think the conspiracy that that nobel laureate winner was part of is when she started to bringing this up people said you're going to bury the thousands of professors studies yeah. and you're gonna you're gonna destroy the field it would have cost careers and money and so he misses it as she was going to use that in a way to be able to make predictions and look better as a scientist yeah Probably, but I think a good 50% of it is money-based. It would have it would have been like um, like an economical crash within the yeah. that you know the medical science and even the the medical academic uh, yeah. part that would have been monstrous. There's um I'm trying to think here. There was a, I was gonna pull up something on the system of peer review. And yeah. I remember uh, about well, I just remember uh, like Einstein himself. I think had. Only ever 
back then the process was you would just send it in and publisher would be like, okay, mm -hmm. and they would publish it if it held up. And then the, the peer review is kind of a strange thing. And I remember right. reading this somewhere where Einstein had sent basically all of his stuff off and the editor always decided to publish himself. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. then all of a sudden he submitted one paper, I believe, called Do Gravitational Waves Exist? And the paper was rejected by remember. the uh, by by somebody who they sent it off to have peer review done on it. And Einstein says, why in the world would, would I send this to yeah. you so that you can send it off to some no mind yeah. who wants to or who, who who has an axe to grind or yeah. who is my competitor? Like peer, might not understand it. Peer does yes. not always mean peer when especially it you doesn't mean pure. <laughs> how, how yes how cutthroat the current state of things are for right. grants and exactly people need to understand it this. is a like fucking to get mess. tenure you need to have papers out there so imagine if you do you have a paper in this in, in my field and everything yeah. i don't want you competing for my grants yeah. older professors get way more grants than younger professors yeah. why and exactly for shit like that and if you come up with a new idea that's going to flip some things upside down you'll never make you're it past first you're going to have to yeah. have your idea vetted by the same people who you're going to turn upside down. Yeah. Good fucking luck. But no, but that's the not going to happen. Is it's, yeah. That's why peer review was never that. Peer review the, was repeatability. Yeah. Was. There was no, that, that people, uh, this is why we need to read about the history of science. Yeah. So that we understand how the shit, what, it, what words mean. Peer review does not mean I send my work to be reviewed by five of my peers in that sense of competitors for them to decide whether or not it should be out there. Because yeah. If I say it like that, you understand fully where, why would they want that? Yeah. Let's say I come up with internal talk and it's reviewed by five people that have made their career on external talk. Mm -hmm. What do you think they're going to say? Yeah. No, right? Yeah, Which is sure. exactly what they all say when I came yeah. up with internal talk, right? So peer, it was, my work was not peer reviewed in that sense. That's not what peer review meant, not the way the, the Greek meant. What it means is like I come up with the idea and it's out there for everybody to see. And then people try to duplicate Mm -hmm. what I come up with and see if I'm right or wrong. Yeah. That's what peer review is. Peer review is not the step before you get published. Yeah. Peer review is the step after exactly. you get published. It's, it's a fucking review. It's not an approval process. And that's what I don't understand. It's, and so now, but no, but that's a system <laughs> defending itself. Exactly. You know why you have peer review? So that though no one knows that for 20 years, we the, the FDA based his drug safety rules on mice that were that basically had a healing factor of Wolverine. That should bring so many lawsuits in the yeah. US. Yeah. Like the, the, the fact that this is not blowing up the academic, medical academic world in the US, that is mind blowing. Yeah. The fact that no one is understanding what it means when it's laid out so clearly. Mm -hmm. We used Wolverine mice to test drugs yeah like <laughs> and then we give them to you and your kids and your parents and yeah your family, exactly your grandparents right. when they're sick and, right and so this is what he's talking about and so when he comes with that and he has to be peer-reviewed before publishing what do you think is going to happen exactly what happened it wasn't published until one editor had a smaller paper because nature said no he had um that, that's the best part he because nature is the number one yeah. uh, publication out there he had a letter of recommendation from the top bi uh, evolutionary biologist at the time, uh, yeah. whose name I forget. He was the, the top dude. And Nature uh, uh, went like this and refused to publish it. He was like, no, nah, not even, they, they didn't even go to step one. The subject was not deemed interesting enough. It wasn't even peer reviewed, the subject, because the, if you can read, you know exactly what that meant yeah. for the system. Nature did that, who's supposed to be the number one stuff it's the system is that bad yeah. money has corrupted the medical world to the to the core yeah well and and that's the thing that's it's not an accusation that everyone in is crooked it's that the way you have to move within that system right will only beget those results i'm not talking that's about it. doctors i'm no. saying the system is corrupted no. to the core like we are seeing the extent of the malevolence of capitalism yeah you, you have being way, unchecked. way too much unchecked money flow exactly having control yeah. within science same thing with politics it's the same thing oh. once you inject a mechanism with i am which not money, a communist with which yeah. money can be the reward 
then you allow money to then be used to control whatever that is, whether it's the science, yeah. whatever the exactly. system is. Right. It will always take that route, always, and it will always grow only that high. And, and the problem forever. is when you come up with an idea, it might be true, might be revolutionary, but could rock the system, then the system will defend itself and not let that idea yeah. forward. Yeah. And, and even if the only thing you're going to upset is the, the, the money issue, the, the money thing is the barrier to all of it anyways. It's, it's, right. But it's so it's money problem. over lives. Yeah. This is what this means. It's money this is over money lives. Over science, By the way, yes. I am not a communist. Uh, I think China and Russia, yeah. USSR at the time, has proven what happens to communism unchecked. Yeah. But that does not mean we don't get to look at what capitalism unchecked can do as well. Exactly. And right now, it's ruining science. Yeah. And I think, well, and just like you said, anything unchecked is the problem. Like, yeah, always. Like I have, no I, have, I have some very libertarian ideals. I understand a lot of systems. But unchecked. However, yeah. you cannot, I don't believe in a libertarian society or a communist society. You need to have, there, there are aspects of everything that you need to lean towards to design a system that works. Do you know what pure libertarian is? It's warlord. Yeah, exactly. If you have a country run by a Total warlord, free for, all. They, free for all, there's a libertarian yeah. system for you. So unchecked, it never works. Yeah. This is the point of society. Yeah. Again, society is a clearing in the forest. Yeah. Everything is supposed to be, a, but it has to be a system based on the, the incentives have to be right. Here. Right. But anyway, that's incentive, a exactly. yeah, But no, in, no, incentives yeah. should be good science. Constraints. Yeah. Good science. But like, so right now, we do not have good science. Right now, we have profitable science. Yeah. Right. And so this, this podcast was great because it showed you exactly the core issue right now at the academic world and the medical world as, okay, but where's the money? Mm -hmm. Show me the money first. And if it disturbs the money, then no one wants to talk about Because this is important because if you look at what the power of the pharmaceutical industry in the medical world that means that whenever a we can put forward a way to heal people that does not require pills we will lose yeah yeah so i there's a lot of things that i can do without pills i will always lose to doctors because i will always lose to the pharmaceutical industry because my way of doing things requires people to do it mm -hmm. requires them being active not in the sense of active, like doing stuff, even though it does, but in the sense of not being passive, which is what giving them a pill is. So the system right now is designed to keep you passive, right, in your thinking, so that you accept a pill instead of accepting you to do what is necessary for you to get better. Yeah. So we will always lose, right, in this system, like with what we do at Strong Fit, we will always lose to the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. That means we will always lose to doctors. Doctors have no incentives to apply Strong Fit. And they have all incentives in the world to give pills instead. Yeah. And I'm not criticizing doctors, I'm criticizing the system. Yeah. Right now, they're doing all their work on the coronavirus and uh, the nurses. There's more nurses and doctors, I believe, anyway. Certainly. Yeah, so yeah. nurses are just as heroes as doctors and everything. I'm going to go 10x on that one. If you've ever been in a medical emergency, yeah. your doctor's probably a good guy. He comes and goes, but you're getting taken care of by nurses. nurses. Yeah. yeah. I, so I don't want to say they're a true hero because then people on the side of doctors are going to get pissed. But we have to... If you ever want to argue with me on the semantics of saying one person's a hero and say, yeah. well, what about these people? Yeah, exactly. Right. So but the, the point is that the, the system right now is designed in a way that it hurts people. And I think those those Wolverine mice prove that point. Yeah. It was about money over people's lives. Literally, like there's not a bigger smoking gun than this shit. Yeah. 20 years straight. We yeah. still don't know if they changed their breeding program. No. And, they, and, I'm, I'm and, and they the did. flaw, of course, had existed for almost 40 years. Right, so that was that should happen twenty years ago, but yeah, but the mice were at play for forty years straight. Yeah, that's insane. That's insane. That is completely insane. Well, let's dive into the Q and A. Bring it on. So we have a few questions here. The first one I want to get into though is a good one. Someone just wanted some further clarification as far as on your like like really can you define anxiety right. a little bit better? I have. So uh, we're gonna do an entire uh, thing on anxiety. Like uh, I want to take people step by step. So. Uh, anxiety, somatic, and everything. What I want to do, first of all, is I want to do like a six months course. Mm -hmm. Six units, six to eight, six to eight months course, six units, where one unit per month, where uh, I go on the chalkboard, I explain that unit, there'll be questions for you to answer, and then we'll give you a workout to test the stuff we talk about with a Q&A at the end of that month, some kind of 
I don't know how, but like a way for me to answer questions or stuff like that. But you're not allowed to go to uh, unit two until you've gone unit one. I'm going to take people by the hand and explain to them what is the nature of anxiety and explain the entire system. If, or, and then I have to go through the nervous system, lactate and yeah. the whole stuff. Right. So then we'll charge like, I don't know, 89 a month. And that's more of a, shit like it's that. like a real, we talked about it a little bit, like a, it's like going to be like an educational based, yes. like very information yes. first. But then practical application, practical, like go train in this capacity yeah. and see if you can root out some of we're these points. Give, that we're we're going to give you the here. workouts because everything has to be experienced. So we're going to go very theoretical, but we're also going to go very practical where you will have to experience what it's like to have had to induce a panic attack with a sandbag, had to come back from it, had to express anger, all that stuff. Yeah. But one unit at a time. So we're going to take you by the hand and make you ex understand and experience the shit. Yeah. That being said, talking about anxiety, I wanted to ju very just for the Q and H, so just ten minutes, talk about something I find interesting. Okay. Right. So let's go just on the physical side of, of um, anxiety. We know there's a relationship between lactate and anxiety. So you raise the lactate in the body, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, lactate gets to the brain, which is normal because lactate is the number one fuel for the brain. Mm -hmm. The most important uh, brain fuel is lactate. Uh, if you get an excess of lactate, that means you're not processing it well as energy. We know that it raises the acidity of the brain and there's been a link between brain acidity and uh, anxiety. Okay. Like when, for example, like uh, you give people already anxious, like more lactate brain stuff, they get into panic attacks. So it, there's an yeah. entire stuff there. So you could see, for example, people in the strength world that always do like VLA max training type always producing lactate would have more anxiety than others so they would have that what i call let's say the physical anxiety in the sense of you have built up so much lactate but your vo2 max is poor because you don't do proper cardio you would have an excess of lactate not that you should produce less but more that you should be able to use it better okay you would have an excess of lactate that would eventually lead to brain acidity and to anxiety to greater anxiety. So VLA max training without VO2 max training would lead to greater anxiety. That we've seen that with yeah. a lot of lifters that are very anxious, mm -hmm. because are in strong men in powerlifting, those are very, very anxious people, right? Yeah. Anger can be uh, one way to express it and stuff like that, right? But if I go to runners that have a very high VO2 max, but a very low VLA max, I also find people that are very, very, very anxious. Yeah. So how come then? Would not would that not, not negate what I just said from the before? It sounds like it would, wouldn't it? Right. What if there is a mental anxiety? And I'll explain what I mean by that. What if those people, those runners, let's take the runners that we know that are very like very high VO2 max, like ninety two percent, ninety four percent VO2 max, extremely high, right? Their problem is that they can run all day, but they can't run fast enough. Because remember, for their case, running the marathon, they can keep on running. That's not the problem. The problem is running in fast enough. Okay. So those people that can run a marathon for in two hours and 15 minutes, do mm -hmm. you think they can run five hours straight? Yeah, no yeah, problem. Yeah. They have no issue doing that. Yeah. So their problem is not cardio. Their problem is running faster. Running faster is based on lactate, on VLA max, not on VO2 max. Right, so what if in that sense their anxiety because they don't have an excess of lactate, obviously. Yeah. But what if that's the problem? They don't have enough lactate. Because okay. they can use it too well, but they don't produce they it enough. They can use it very well, but there's not enough, uh, there's not enough, not enough to water be, in that pot. Yeah. Exactly right. So how would I produce more lactate if I don't do it in training? Well, I would need a sympathetic reaction, mm -hmm. right? I would need um, to create the lactate any which way I can. So that means more, you know, higher metabolism. I would basically need a sympathetic reaction. How could I create a sympathetic reaction? By fucking up my life to the point where my stress level goes up, yeah. which allows a sympathetic reaction, which allows me to produce the lactate that I need in order to go faster. Well, that sounds very really interesting because first, my first inclination when you say that is, well, it sounds like a lot of the self-sabotaging type behavior I often see. But it also sounds like something else too. It's not just behavior like you're fucking up your life. Often people can just choose to interpret things in a way that's right. going to take them there meaning like all right everything that someone says about this one thing i'm going to make sure that i fucking have a 10 out of 10 reaction to right but so because you can then you're take still that, there right you can yeah. see take that a bit further we know that lactate is number one brain 
uh, number one fuel for the brain. So that means cognition is why by far takes the most energy out of everything. The brain takes more energy than anything and cognition is the higher brain function is what used the most of. Yeah. So that means that in order to have high cognition, I would need to have high lactate. So that means that if I'm someone who doesn't train but is very verbal or st uh, studies science a lot or is very active with my cognition level or stuff like that, mm -hmm. in order to be able to produce with my brain, I would need to have a lot of lactate. But if I'm not naturally that person, I'm going to have to find that lactate somewhere. And if I don't train, where do I find it? Through stress. stress yeah. So I create stress in my life. I'm an anxious person to produce the lactate that I need to be able to produce through my brain. Crazy. I'm thinking Dr. Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I'm thinking about a number of people that I know. Very, very smart, very verbal, right? Super high level of anxiety. What if it's necessary, for, that anxiety is necessary for them to be at that level because they are not producing the light that necessary through physical training? Would seem to make sense. Right? Yeah. That'd be interesting. Yeah. So you'd have two types of anxiety. The anxiety you create mentally, yeah. fine, in your behavior, and the anxiety you create physically. Wow. I mean, yeah. in order because and it's a lactate in both cases. So one side needs to do higher VA, VO2 max, the other needs to do, need needs higher VLA max. Yeah, makes sense. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. So it still is the excess of lactate that is the issue. It's just a matter of well, you're either, one side you're either yeah. creating the excess by training. The way you're training. Fine, you, you, not excess, but you, not excess. you need uh, a, uh, enough word? of lactate. Poor ratio. You either create through training yeah. or through your life. Your imagination. <laughs> well, no, because eventually, well, no, yeah, because eventually you real. will create a situation yeah. where your life is a wreck and actually yeah. stresses you. The yeah. problem is it might be you creating that. So because how many times, how many times do you see people like guys saying like uh, all women are bitches because it's like, no, you only date. Those women. Yeah. You only find those women yeah, you're, today. You're only signing up for that for that particular experience. woman. Yeah. yeah. And how many guys are? Uh, how many women are like? Oh, all guys are scumbag. They all do that. I'm like, no, honey. That's the guy you act, you always yeah. date the same douchebag. Yeah. Your your dude picker is really yes, messed it, up. Yes. The problem is the guys you choose. Like they know we're not all like this. Yeah. It's the guys you choose, right? And so it works for both men and women on that one. So, but eventually that's true that that stresses you. But that's yeah. because that's what you created. And what if you do it fundamentally so that you, for a good reason, yeah. in the sense of you need to be able to produce out of your brain, and so therefore the anxiety is required. So that means that if you were that person doing more VO2 max training, would only make things worse. So I'm thinking CrossFit, which is very high VO2 max. So if you're that person who not naturally produces a high level of lactate, you go into CrossFit, which raises your VO2 max, your capacity to use lactate as fuel. Yeah. then he would drive to more anxiety so he can perform in life. But back to higher VO2 max, more CrossFit, therefore more anxiety. Nice. Because more lactate through your behavior. So that means more CrossFit, more CrossFit means a more fucked up life and more anxiety. Unless you balance the arch. Unless you train correctly, which is a high VLA max, but that's what they suck at, so they don't want to do it. Pace, pace, pace. Does that make sense? Very interesting. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing for you to unfold upon that question, <laughs> though. That, that's good. That was extremely yeah. thorough. I kind of thought you were just going to drop a couple things on them. That's good. Um, so here's another good one. This was in regards to um, episode 76 and 77, the uh, nociceptors and non-nociceptor fibers. Uh, is the reason heat and ice reduce localized pain yeah. because of the nociceptors, non-nociceptors in the same way as foam rolling, like you mentioned in 76 and 77? If so, does that mean we should also avoid those so we're not masking symptoms of bigger problems? Yes, that's, a, that's actually a very good question, a very good point. Uh, I, I do not know enough about the, what the ice and the heat does topically. To truly answer that question, because honestly, I never really studied. No, mm -hmm. but my if I had an educated guess to give would be yeah, it's any way that is used to make the pain go away, but as a symptom blocker instead of an actual cure mm -hmm. is a problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, because that I've seen, like how many people like you know snatch again in external talk or whatever end up with and then they put ice, but all all 
that the ice allows you to do is go back to snatch the next day. Therefore, you never fix the problem yeah, if that you created in the first If you're a professional place. pitcher and you got your shoulder and elbow you on gotta ice do between what you gotta games, do. Yeah. the reason they have ice on the shit between after games is because they got three days and they got to be out on the mound again, five days, whatever. And it by is. the way, doing a very unnatural movement. For sure. Like if they were only throwing fastballs, it'd be a lot easier, but they have to do all the curveball and yeah. that stuff, which puts so much pressure on the you shoulder ever, and elbow. Do you ever see those like, really high speed photos or high speed videos of like of a pitcher a oh, major man. league pitcher throwing you i swear to god you see like a a, a horseshoe bend even in the forearm yeah, yeah. the amount of fucking torque, yeah. torque on that is unbelievable yeah and but the key why is it so bad for shoulder and elbow because you go it's a natural movement it's not a natural movement to throw something light very fast yeah that's not how it's designed like there's a weight at which if you that slows you down enough that it becomes safe a baseball is light enough that you can achieve great velocity but at the expense of the person throwing it yeah. if it was a bit heavier they'd be a lot safer but then they wouldn't throw fast yeah i have a question too yeah. can i because we're that's right you, you answered yeah. the question i just have a question on this is throwing i should have probably know more about this is throwing a evolutionarily natural movement for a human being at all you mean like uh what well, depends anything. what you if i throw a spear a rock i mean i feel like the using using weapons or using tools it has to be that's what throwing would be right would have to fall somewhere beyond the era in which we started using tools a javelin yeah would but like yeah. but almost all of our physicality was designed and kind of optimized before that point, wasn't it? Like, it was designed for that, right? Yeah. So if you look at, well, throwing... Is any throwing then, like, seems to be a pretty new introduction, relatively speaking. Throwing light stuff okay. is, right? Because if you try to win wars by throwing stones, it's going to be rough. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So at some point, but even the stones had to be bigger because they have to have... Uh, yeah. That's what they have the... Yeah. Whatever they call yeah. it in English. Uh, so... As, as a sport movement, that's why we value accuracy, by the way, mm -hmm. on the pitchers. Because yeah. we don't have competition to see how fast they throw, because it doesn't matter, accuracy. Because then, evolutionary speaking, that would have, there, there would be a point there. Yeah. But it's a very, very specific activity. Yeah. And there is no martial art of throwing. Because it's not a good, you know, outside yeah. of the ninja with their thing, yeah. it's, no, it's not a good... Yeah. It's uh, very interesting. Yeah. It's yeah, a very, I, very I was narrow. Just curious as to where that fell in. Like, narrow is the word. I was like, what are it's the very uses? Narrow. Very narrow. Very so narrow. So it does not seem like that would have been folded in very early. Th in the this process. is why, if you look in a test of manhood, throwing, I can't remember. I, they might be, but I don't remember a culture outside of the Olympic Games that had throwing as a test of manhood. And even then, it was a javelin. Yeah. Or the heavy weight. Shot put, yeah. Or the shot put. So both. One is accuracy with a javelin. You yeah. could see that directly because yeah. of war, which at the time of the Greeks, they had javelins. Mm -hmm. And shot put because it means strength. Yeah. But if you look at most cultures' taste of manhood, what will you see? You will see picking something heavy off the floor and you'll see heavy carries. Yeah. Why? Because farming. Mm -hmm. The taste of manhood was relating to are you strong enough? And that means can you farm heavy enough? Yeah. That's the early strongman competitions, the Viking stuff. <coughs> we should do an episode sometime. We talked about this a little bit on um, on those things, on those yep. like rites of passage. Mm -hmm. I would like I'll do that. We'll do an episode sometime, guys. I'll pull up like I'll find like a handful of interesting uh, examples. Yeah. Historically, we'll do that, and yeah. then you, you can kind of see where the need or where that would have come from. I think that'll be a fun a fun yeah, subject. To exactly. So we'll go into that. But you, you can tell how throwing was. Uh, like running fast, that's that's been there. Yeah. Uh, wrestling, that's been there. Um, strength has been there. Yeah. The pure throwing for accuracy was a very very narrow specific yeah. window. All right, we got a question here about the uh, overhead yoke carry. Yeah. Um, could you please explain why and how the overhead yoke carry fixes the overhead problems gradually? As a background of my thinking, as I understand increasing the stress and load forces, the large stress and load forces the large muscle groups to engage to support the shoulder. You're missing the point now. Yeah. I seem... Oh, I thought you were talking about me. I was like, I'm trying to read my best. No, him, no, no, no. <laughs> I said, I, I seem to be missing a link between that yes. and how these muscles become available to use 
in a range of motion which the nervous system would not allow me to access at lighter loads. Right, because I know I know what he's saying. I got a little bit further. Okay. I just want to give him all his yeah. due here because it's, it's a well-worded question. The, the gradual increase in range of motion for other movement patterns seems to make sense to me yes. as a build-up through activating IT and then ET before moving into the main body of the work. I get it. Then... Does this mean that the overhead yoke carry would only be effective at a point when the pec and lat can achieve sufficient range to begin to support the load overhead? That's not what uh, the overhead yoke carry is designed for. So let's talk about what the overhead yoke is designed for and then what we do want to be doing as far as like how, how it's going to help with overhead right. problems. So what was the overhead yoke carries uh, created? It was created at first uh, because I had um, crossfitters coming that were, uh, again, pressing into an external torque when they were catching the snatch. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but even, you could see that at the top of the overhead squat, they were still in external torque. Yeah. Right. So why did I go with the overhead yoke carry? The point was not, um, I was, the point was to make them engage short head of the bicep bicep and lat, so internal torque. So why did I use the yoke? Because the yoke, because of the way it's built, the weight is at the bottom and the weight oscillates back and forth, which means that you have to control the weight in the frontal plane instead of the sagittal plane. Mm -hmm. So what he's talking about is, yes, the overhead yoke carry is not an opener. It's not designed to increase your mobility the same way the openers do. The point of the overhead yoke carry is to make you work the stabilization in the frontal plane instead of doing it in a sagittal plane. Sagittal plane is up and down, mm -hmm. frontal plane is... So the way the yoke is built, right, the weight is at the bottom and oscillates, making you stabilize in a frontal plane. By having to stabilize in a frontal plane, you have to use your pecs, bicep, and, uh, and lats. You can only stabilize in internal torque, not in external torque. So the first thing you see when you have people that press in external torque on the snatch or whatever, on the yoke carry, is they go backwards yeah, they with the yoke. right out. They go backwards right away. They the so yoke that's, goes back, spits you out the front. Exactly. And every time I'm like, no, 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 that way. Yes. Right? So <laughs> just to be an asshole. And, um, and so every time I was using the overhead yoke carry to make them understand that their way of stabilizing the barbell was incorrect. Mm -hmm. And so I had, for example, uh, CrossFit athletes, uh, women, that could not overhead squat what they were snatching by yeah. 10 by 20 one by 20 kilos Jeez. most of them about 10 kilos which is crazy right yeah because nice. you you cannot stabilize in external torque external torque is all concentric very explosive so by forcing them to stabilize a yoke that forces them where the stabilization happens in the frontal plane they could right away feel that there was an issue that the traps that they were using would not allow them to stabilize the yoke and so from there, before you can correct, so it's, let, let's, to, to remember what Epictetus says is to, to heal someone, they have to be, you have to, you, they have to be willing to give up the, the things that make them sick. That should be the first thing any coaches uh, would do with a client is make them understand what makes them sick. So in that sense, your shoulder hurts. Let me show you why it hurts, because you're trying to stabilize in external torque, which is not possible. So how do I do that? Not just by explaining, but by making them feel that on a yoke that makes them stabilize in a frontal plane, and right away they see there's a problem. And from there, we can start the transition of catching a snatch uh, in internal torque. But I cannot make you catch a snatch in internal torque at the bottom of the snatch, because of mobility. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to show you, show you how to stabilize the barbell overhead where your mobility is at the greatest, which is standing up. Okay. So the weight of the yoke might be too much for some people. Right, yeah. that can be a problem. That's very often the case. Right. Because yeah. if I increase the weight, I increase, uh, basically I decrease mobility. So usually that's the problem that you see. It's not that the yoke is not doing its job, it's that the yoke is too heavy. Sometimes an empty yoke on its own is too heavy for a lot of people. For most people. Yeah. So then that's why I was saying, like you have to take like a uh, axle bar, put some four by fours on the side. But the key is stabilizing in the frontal plane. And that's why you say four by fours on the side, wood, on the side as opposed light. to the ropes. Exactly, and right? that'll be light. Because with right. the ropes, it's not that it's gonna oscillate three hundred. Right. And bands don't work degrees, because yeah. they put you back into the sagittal plane, which is up and down, which is the opposite of what I want. So the problem you're talking about is that the yoke is too heavy, therefore decreases mobility. But if you do it with a 
light yolk that forces the person to uh, stabilize in the frontal plane, they will use the right muscles, right? And in that sense, they will learn to use internal torque for catching the barbell, therefore uh, bearing their mobility over time. Yeah. So it, that it's the thought process that the, that whoever asked the question has wrong, basically. Yeah. The bends allow you to, uh, when the bends, when they come down and the way they weigh up, the tension is removed. So that allows you to keep pressing against the bar. Because mm -hmm. when the, the kettlebell the goes up, bounce. when the kettlebell goes up, there is no tension. Yeah. And so that allows you every time to pulse with your, uh, with your traps. So you're not stabilizing. You're just pressing continuously with your traps, which makes it worse. What about using a, a, a cambered bar? Overhead, that could work. Overhead. I see. I see. That, 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 that sometimes is a passable way because you can load yep. those on the bottom and you can... Uh, that could work. I think you could make that do... It's going to be similar at least. Pieces but. of wood, put an axle and then go... Yeah. Like I know, well, yeah, it's... Okay, so it's more work and then you have to find a way to make it work. I yeah. agree. But uh, uh, then again, uh, going back to where I opened the podcast with, is like you want a satisfactory answer that does not exist. Like, can I do it with Ben? Can I do it with chains? No. I give you the constraints. Yeah. Frontal plane. If you do chains, they move sideways. They're going to wreck your shoulders. If you use bends, you go sagittal plane. It's not working. I want the stuff to stabilize in a, you know, like forward, backward kind of thing to force you to engage the pegs, the shoulder, the bicep. From there, if you don't have access to one, make one. But you cannot change the constraints without changing the exercise. So people are like, well, I can't do a yoke. I want to do it with bands. Fine. It's not an overhead yoke carry anymore. You're doing something else which is fine, but then don't complain that it's not working because you've changed the nature of the exercise. Well, and it's also interesting too for us, it's a thing I probably need to do a better job of is when we do these things too, is so often we, I'll post a, it'll be a video of you or I or someone doing overhead yoke carry, right? I don't know that we've on the podcast mentioned that that is specifically the plane of movement, which, which we want that little, I I, you, that you've said so it a lot in other times. things. But, but I always oh, think, their podcast, I guess. Yeah, I but it's it. also difficult too. It's like if it's some people would just see us doing a movement and say, oh, well, that's the movement I need to do. Right. Um, but that's the thing too, like that we face all the time is like, oh yeah, he's doing it like that, but I got my own way of doing it. Yeah. Okay, fine. But then don't complain. It's not working. Yeah, or make sure it does fit within the constraints of right. I'm, And people say, well, it does. No, because again, they want that satisfactory answer of like, well, it's the same thing. The weight goes up and I'm like, no, I, trust me, I had exact that yeah. problem. I had people taking the barbell sitting and just shrugging with the barbell. <laughs> and I was like, that is the exact opposite yeah. of what I said. And so like I had that from, I won't say who he was, but they were basically trying to steal the idea from us. It's that, oh, yeah, 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 as usual, same company, <laughs> always, they take our stuff and then they were like, but they're going to change it so it doesn't look like they do what we do. Yeah. And by doing that and not understanding the principles, fucked it up completely, making someone shrug with the barber, mm -hmm. which is exactly what I don't want. Yeah. Then you're going back to using your traps to stabilize the weight overhead. Exactly, exactly the opposite of what I want, making the problem worse. And then, of course, going to fuck up the person's shoulder so and then complain who, that the overhead you carry doesn't work. Yeah. So anyone who trusts that person because they trusted the person saying right. that thing is on a path gonna blame to getting me. more injured, right. but then it's going to be an exercise that they think they got from you in a roundabout way. And then way. I'm going to get yeah. blamed and, and they're all going to say overhead you carry doesn't work. Yeah, because that's not what you did. No. So that's the problem too, is people do what they want, right? Yeah. But then after that, manage to blame me for it <laughs> when they didn't do what I asked them to do in the first place. Yeah. I get a bit frustrated on that one. I hear you there. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think we're pretty close. That's cool. all the questions I've got for today. I, I didn't come in with an army of questions because I wanted to open with the uh, beginning bit. Yeah, but, and uh, plus so, some of them are, are very specific where you're asking us to fix you. And I, I can't do that because I don't know enough. Yeah, I will say if you put anything in here that like is really, really us having to walk through your specific things, that's just not what we can do here. It just takes too long. No, but it's not that. It's just it's a one-on-one -on -one coaching. Exactly. How do you want yeah. me to advise you on what you do if I don't know, I haven't seen you move, I don't know your specifics, yeah. I don't know your background, history of injuries, history of athletics? Well, there's very little like, that you can kind of do either from this format. I could tell you some things to go do and then try, but then what? Do you get them right? Do you get them wrong? It's no, just, like, it's, a, it's, a, it's a format with which... We can't do much individual no, like, I, coaching I want, on this. This thing. is a relationship we yeah. have with you guys where this has to go both ways. Yesterday, I got a message uh, last week, two weeks, 
on Instagram, uh, no, it was yesterday that uh, while I was trying, to, a lady asked me about the protocol. I said, go see the Invictus lecture. Yeah. She comes back, it's like, I've been on the protocol for one week. I haven't lost weight yet. And my answer was like, this has never been done uh, to lose weight, yeah. ever. I, you will not find a place where I say that the protocol was designed to lose weight, ever. Yeah. Because that's not what I do. And I was like, can you lose weight doing the protocol? Of course. Yeah. Water weight because of the sympathetic, yeah. all, all that stuff, of course. But that is not the point of the protocol. And so I'm like, we're going, this is a relationship. Like you're going to have to put some work into this. And, but work is not just like, oh, I did what you said. That's not the work we're talking about. Is you're going to have to inform yourself, to educate yourself. Yeah. Like I have so many videos. Listen to the video again, I Invictus. I didn't say it was to lose weight. Like you are taking what you want out of the entirety and generalizing one phrase that I say or one concept because that's what you wanted to hear. Guess what that is? That's functional segregation. Yeah. Right. The problem is you are evidently mistaken when you take one piece out of an entire concept because you didn't want to hear the rest of the set I have to say because it doesn't fit what you want to do. It's like saying, well, like, well, I, talk, I took the coffee, I do no fix November and I took the coffee out, but you don't take the alcohol and the yeah. sugar and the stuff, yeah. then no, no fix November won't work because the point was never just the sugar yeah. or just the caffeine or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so you can't then complain that you didn't get the effects of it if you didn't follow the constraints. Yeah, there's really no, the, it, like, like Julian said, the, the, the relationship dynamic is the thing because there's a lot that we're giving out and then if you <laughs> right. want us to go back and compile it for you specifically, that's just kind of a lot of this work. This is why the fitness industry is so fucked up. Yeah. Because the relationship is broken. Yeah. And we have our share on this mm -hmm. within oh, the fitness sure. industry. For I sure. won't disagree with that. And we as an organization are always trying to stop, right. prevent ourselves from falling short on those things. It is always a challenge because that is the norm. Right. But you have your share out there as well, where you keep incentivizing coaches to sell you bullshit. Yeah. By doing that stuff, saying, well, just make me lose weight. I can, that's very easy in three weeks. The problem yeah. is you'll gain all of it back. It's not sustainable. I'll wreck your body, your health and everything. But if you keep putting it out there, you eventually will find people that are less ethical. And then, then I will sell you the six week stuff mm -hmm. because people like money. And so, but then, you know what I mean? Like you are creating also you are not working on the relationship from your side either. There's this, this is a system that was not designed. It was a system that exists right now, the way, the way yep. it is. And we've talked about in the past, a system designed so that more right. cars can be in and, more, and can park right. is going to always allow more cars in a city. Uh, anytime with a system like this, if, well, weight loss, if we're going to build this, this nutrition system towards weight loss, you'll get weight loss at the yep. expense of lots of other things. So, weight loss itself has never ever entered the like things that are going to be put in the gas pedal putting the right. foot to the gas and if on we thing. only it's put only it, about yeah. what is about health and what is exactly right and clear signals and if you put it only on weight loss you are basically taking people like us yeah. out of the equation to replace them by again like unscrupulous people that are only interested in making money yeah. this is the system you are creating by asking you know, to the, the protocol to just occur yeah. in weight loss and not caring about the other stuff as yeah. well. Like this is a relationship. We all have a part to play in this. Yeah. And, and we, I'll repeat it again and again and again, because this is fundamentally where the issue is as well. It is not just on us. I'll take, we'll take the blame for a lot of things within the fitness industry, but it is not just on us. You have your share responsibility into where we are, as a relationship right now and it has to be worked on both sides yeah. stop putting it into like i just need to lose weight stuff and, and understand what you're inviting the evil you're inviting yeah. inside your house when you say that yeah that's i think is the important thing yeah, yeah. so well that's i think got us wrapped up for today cool. guys we are i was actually getting worried the uh the beginning conversation i was like Fuck, we, we should just make a whole episode out of the mice yeah, and the wine yeah, thing. It was but, a good episode. But it went good. It went really good. So It was an important um, thing to talk about. Yeah, anyway. exactly. So, well, thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Um, geez, you're, you're still getting two episodes a week at this point. Yep. 
I don't see that subsiding unless uh, Julian adds four or five more projects. Otherwise, yeah, right. yeah. Otherwise, we've got uh, I do that. We've got strongfitlibrary.com. That's where you can find. If you want to find some of these information and do searches for yourself, you can search categories. There's keywords, everything you can imagine there. Uh, strongfitlibrary.com. It's free and it's all for you. We also have, you can support the podcast at podcast.strongfit.com. You can donate one time. You can do a subscription model. Um, whatever we uh, also leave us reviews wherever you're listening or watching make sure you subscribe uh, you can find equipment at strongfitequipment.com strongfitequipment.eu we also have apparel all sorts of good stuff um, snatch some of that up while you're sitting at home like the mailmen are still working right I'm not listening so I have no idea what you're saying <laughs> this motherfucker yeah what <laughs> I just completely dozed I mean, off. I was so gone. And I'm if like, it what? wasn't for microphone noise of him, you unplugging it, he would just pick it up and drop it yeah, while I walked away. I'd be gone. <laughs> if there was no video, I'd be over there already. <laughs> the best thing to do is we do need it would be a cameraman so that for these moments we could just pan to me. Yeah. So it's a little better of a pitch. What? <laughs> It's like if you go to a restaurant and and uh, like you, or you go up to the cashier or whatever, yeah. and, and they're just staring off into dead yeah. space. It's the vibe you put off sometimes. Pretty much. Oh, totally. You like subverting my pitch. So, use that camera. <laughs> All there right. you go. But uh, I don't even know where we're at. StrongFit equipment there. StrongFit.com is where you'll find seminars and everything else that we have there. And StrongFit on YouTube. Jesus, that's probably everything. Man cooking Fitness. Cooking show. Oh, yeah. The cooking show is currently still on our YouTube channel. And uh, we're putting those out as quickly as we possibly can. Hope you guys really, really, really like it. Uh, lots of healthy, protocol-friendly ingredients there. Or like and subscribe. Dishes there. Like it's God damn it. Richard's going to... By the way, if you've watched this, Richard keeps going to this thing that I certainly am not doing on the first pass. Yeah. But I can, when I have time, go back through and kind of find them as long as I make them work. But... Uh, he keeps doing that to me just to try to make me do all this extra work. And I was like, no, no, no. Now that's just going to yeah. look weird yeah. until I get around. No, to we're it not doing that months. shit. I like it. Subscribe. <laughs> like, no. but, uh, but yeah, that's everything. That's in Manta Fitness for Australia, New Zealand for the apparel and sandbags. And I don't know. That's enough. That's yeah. Strong Fit One on Instagram, Tyler F. and So on Instagram, and Rare Barracuda. See you later.